will start at the earliest one, which I believe is two, and we'll work through in numerical order. Electricity Inc. had 325000 in 2023 taxable income. Using the tax schedule below, by the way, I will always give you the tax schedule. I will never make you remember it. Um, what are the company's 2023 income taxes, average tax rate, and marginal tax rate, uh, respectively? First thing to do is to look at that $325,000. We'll see which bracket it's going to fall into, right? Which bracket's that going to fall into? Yeah, 39%. So we can already uh, pick 39% as our marginal rate. By the way, that's uh, the marginal rate in every single answer. Have we helped ourselves any? No. Okay, so now let's uh, figure out what is the taxable income here. So I'm going to take 0 0.15 times, how much is in that first bracket? 50,000. Plus, uh, I'm going to take 0 0.25, how much is in that next bracket? 25,000. Now, it is not 24999 Do you think any government is going to let you have that dollar tax-free? Absolutely not. Okay, uh, what's the next tax bracket? It's 34%. And how much is in that tax bracket? 25000 And then finally, we have 0 0.39. And... How much income do we have in that bracket? Which, yeah, so we take our 325000 which is our pre-tax income. Is that right? And then subtract 100000 right? Because that's the bottom of that bracket. Okay, so 15% uh, of 50000 I think that's 7500 bucks. Is that right? Yes. Okay, 25% uh, of 25000 Is that 6250 Okay. And then 34% of 25,000 bucks. I'm going to need some help on that one. 8,500? Yes. Do I get a second on that? Yeah. Okay. And then what is 225,000 times 0 .39? 87,000. 87,750. 87,750. Okay, how am I going to figure out the total tax that I owe? Yeah. Just going to add all these things together. I've got 13,750, 21,750, 22,250. Um, oh, did I mess something up there? 110,000. 110, okay, so you're not going to let me do that math in my head. I feel. Yeah. yeah, okay. You know I like showing off. Okay, so do you see how we got there? Okay, now the final question is, what is the average tax rate for the firm? Does anyone have any idea how to do that? Yeah, right. yeah we're going to take that 110000 in taxes and divide it by our 325000 in pre-tax revenue or pre-tax income. And that's going to give us 33.85%. By the way, which one of those do you think is more important for decision-making purposes, the marginal tax rate or the average? Marginal. The marginal. Because keep in mind, whatever extra money we're going to make is going to be at the higher tax rate, right? I do have a question. Go ahead. So, as long as, so what if the additional income you make Put you say over that three hundred and thirty-five thousand. Does that push your next marginal? Does that put you in the yeah. next marginal? Yeah. And so we would say that the marginal uh, rate is thirty-nine thousand or is thirty-nine percent. But if you were truly, let's say, where you're going to get another hundred thousand, then you would say ten thousand. That's going to be at thirty-nine percent, and then the next ninety thousand would be at the thirty-four percent rate. Okay. Yep. But that becomes your marginal at that. Yeah. At that point, it does become your marginal, right? Mm -hmm. If the question asked about the marginal um, tax rates, uh -huh. in that case, it's not 34%, right? No, exactly. I, I, I'm, I'm following where he led to, and that was going beyond that. Right. Yeah. Don't be messing with Ms. Wynn's head. I'm sorry. Okay. It was we okay? Kids, so. Yeah, because when I ask you the marginal tax, here's, here's the definition of the marginal tax rate. The tax rate we're going to pay on the very next dollar we earn. 
right? And that's what we make our decision based on. So for example, when I uh, take on extra work in the summertime to teach for the university, I get paid extra money. And that extra money is not at my average tax rate, it's at my marginal tax rate. And in fact, it may push me into another bracket. Now, when I get pushed into another bracket, does that raise the tax rate on everything I've already earned? No, it's just that extra. I hate it when people say, well, I don't want to take that job. It might push me into another tax bracket. I'm like, look, you idiot. You're going to be making more money. Now, you'll be paying a higher percentage of it, but you'll still end up better off. OK, so does that answer question two? Who had question two? Are you good? Sweet. OK, now we are on to question four. Barney's Franks has net cash flow from operating activities for the last year of $21 million. The income statement shows that net income is $25 million, depreciation is $7 million. During the year, the change in inventory on the balance sheet was an increase of $6 million. Change in accrued wages and taxes was an increase of $2 million. And change in accounts payable was an increase of $2 million. Oh, pardon me. At the end of the year, the balance of accounts receivable was $7 million. What was the end of the year balance for accounts receivable? And you're like, oh my goodness. But here's what you need to realize. We're talking, by the way, this is not cash flow from operation, or not cash flow from assets, right? It's not operating cash flow. This is the accounting concept of cash flows from operating activities. It's the top part of the statement of cash flows. This is just the top part of the statement of cash flows. And the way that part is developed is something called the indirect method. Remember, net income uh, does not represent cash. Oh my goodness, why is there a Casio calculator before me? <laughs> Mr. Nylon, which weapon do you train with? The one you're going to fight with or the one that you just prefer? The, the one you're going to fight with. Do you believe me now? This man, 31 years in the military, I think he knows, right? <laughs> okay. Now, what that means is we need to take that net income. It's got all sorts of non-cash crap in it. And we're going to take that net income and we're going to make adjustments for all that non-cash crap so we can figure out what actually is the cash flow from our operations. And so we said we start with the net income in the indirect method. And that net income is how much? 25 million. Okay, now we've got to add back depreciation. Why are we adding back depreciation? It's a non-cash expense and it's been subtracted out of that net income, right? It's not in there. And so we've got to add that back. So far, so good. Now, that's the easy part. Otherwise, we've got to start looking at our current accounts. And here's the thing to remember. If uh, an asset increases, cash decreases. Think about this. If I go out and buy a bunch of inventory with cash, what happens? Inventory goes up, cash goes down. What if I, someone pays off their accounts receivable? The accounts receivable go down and the cash goes up. Assets and cash always go in the opposite direction. Assets and cash always go in the opposite direction. So when I figure out the cash impact of these things, of changes in assets, I'm going to say subtract the change in that current asset account. Then I'm going to look at my current liabilities. And the thing to remember about liabilities is when they go up, the cash goes up. You borrow $100 from your friend. What happens to your liabilities? They go up. But what happens to the cash in your pocket? Also goes up, right? And so we're going to add the changes in those current uh, liability accounts. Now, another thing to keep in mind here. Anytime you see the word payable, that's a liability. Anytime you see the word payable, that's a liability. And anytime you see the word accrued, accrued, that's, you, sh you should also trip off that that's a liability. Now, there is one current liability we're not going to be concerned about, and that is the notes payable. 
because notes payable is taken care of down in the financing activities, not the operating activities. Any questions so far? Okay, here we go. Uh, during the year, the change in inventory on the balance sheet was an increase of six million. Okay, so the change, uh, and by the way, inventory, asset or liability? Assets. 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 So we're going to be subtracting that change in inventory, and so I'm going to write minus six here. This is the impact on cash. It's going to drive cash down by six because we had to spend an extra six to put that inventory on the shelf. Okay. Change, oh, da, da, da. Change in accrued wages and taxes. Wait a minute, accrued wages and taxes, is that asset or liability? liability. Yeah, it's a liability. When liabilities go up, then the cash goes up. So I'm gonna say plus the change in accrued wages and taxes, and how much was that? Two million. So it's plus two. So I'm just, I'm not gonna write the plus, but you know it's there. Okay, now let's see, we've got uh, accounts payable, is that a liability or an asset? Liability, and so we're going to say uh, plus the change in accounts payable. How much did the accounts payable change? Two. two. Yeah, plus two, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now, there's one thing left here, one current account we haven't talked about other than cash, right? Uh, which one is that? Yeah, accounts receivable. And remember that we are going to subtract the changes for asset accounts because when assets go up, cash goes down. And so I'm going to say minus the change in accounts receivable here. We don't know that. We don't know it. So I'm going to put an X there. And then I'm going to add all that together. And what do you think that adds up to? That's your net cash flows from operating activities, right? So, net cash flows from operating activities. I can't just love these long things, right? Okay, so oh, what's that gonna be? What number? 2021. Yeah, so keep in mind, uh, that was the first number they threw at us, right? And a lot of students wanna jump right on that and start using it, but in truth, we didn't need it until the very end. Okay, now let's see, do a little math here. 32, 26, 30, 30 minus, oh, there we go. 30 minus x is 21. How much is x? X is uh, 6, yeah, it's 30 minus x is 21. Nine. Nine, very good. So x is equal to the change in accounts receivable, which is nine. Now, how much was the accounts receivable at the beginning of the year? Seven. And then we're going to add that new nine. And what's that going to give us the end of the year? Sixteen. Okay, who asked for number four? Are you satisfied? Yeah. Very good. Sheet shows next net fixed assets of 22 million. The fixed assets could currently be sold for 26 million. Um, and then they changed the name of the company. I don't know why. Uh, but the current balance sheet shows current liabilities of 6 million and net working capital of 4 million. If all the current accounts were liquid today, liquidated today, the company would receive 6 million in cash after paying out 6 million in liabilities. What's the book value of the assets today? What's the market value of the assets? Okay. I should have given you this hint right up front. Read the question before you read the question at the end before you start reading the problem. And so then we would know what we were looking for. Book value is what you find on the balance sheet. Market value is what you could get if you sold the stuff, right? Okay, so uh, net fixed assets of $22 million. By the way, uh, total assets is equal to net fixed assets plus Current assets. Now, here's the problem. Have we been given current assets? No. no, we have been given net working capital and current liabilities. And here's what you need to remember. The net working capital 
is equal to current assets plus current liabilities. Uh, sorry. Minus. Minus. Very good. Okay. Now, can I rearrange that to find current assets using networking capital? Yeah. All I got to do is say CA is equal to networking capital plus the current liabilities. Does that make sense? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute that in. It's called the substitution principle. Anywhere I see current assets, I can put in networking capital plus current liabilities. So I've got net fixed assets plus uh, networking capital plus current liabilities. Okay. So here's what I want to do. I want to make two columns here. Book value, market value. And then I want to write down net fixed assets, networking capital, and current liabilities. Okay, so uh, what is the book value of our net fixed assets? 22 million, straight off of the, uh, straight off the balance sheet. What's the market value of those assets? Yeah, 26. By the way, it would not be uncommon for the assets to have a higher market value than a higher book value. In fact, that's the usual situation. Okay, the current balance sheet shows current liabilities of $6 million. So there's a six right there. And a uh, networking capital of $4 million. Do we have enough information to figure out book value already? Yeah, how much is the book value going to be? 32, right? Okay. Immediately, what does that allow us to do? We can narrow it down from four choices to two, right? Do you see that? Okay. So now we've got down to two choices. The other question is, what's the market value here? And this is where it gets a little hairy. If all the current assets were liquidated today, the company would receive six million in cash after paying six million in liabilities. And so that six million in liabilities would be current liabilities, uh, but what would that cash that they receive afterwards, what would we call that? It's actually this networking capital, right? It's what's left over after you pay the liabilities. That's networking capital. And so it's also, what, six? Did they say that? Six and six? Yes. Okay. Now, 26 plus 12 is 38. And so the answer is 32 and 38. Questions? Keep an eye out for the opportunity to eliminate uh, answer choices because it improves your probability of guessing correctly if you can't get the other half. Okay, so that was number seven. And now we are on to number eight. Fancy Pants, year-end price on its common stock is five bucks. The firm had a profit margin of 11%, total assets of 25 million, a total asset turnover of 0.4, no preferred stock, and there are 5.5 million shares of common stock outstanding. What is the PE ratio for Fancy Pants? Oh my goodness, what a pain. Okay, so let's start thinking through what is PE? PE is the share price divided by the earnings per share. Okay, now, how am I going to find earnings per share? Oh, by the way, do I know the stock price? Yes. Yeah, it's five bucks, right? So I've got it. So now what I need to do is figure out this earnings per share. Earnings per share is equal to net income divided by what? Share outstanding. Yeah, the number of shares outstanding. Um, do we have the number of shares outstanding? 5.5 million, right? Okay, uh, so that means we need to figure out net income. Net income, I'm going to say it's equal to profit margin times sales. Does that sound right? Yeah, so profit margin times sales. And do we have the profit margin? Yes. Yeah, it's 11%. So remember, if you're using it in an equation, always use a decimal. Uh, but do we have sales? Yeah. No. What do they give us, though? Total they give us total assets, and they give us the total asset turnover. And we know that total asset turnover is equal to sales divided by total assets. And so if I were to solve that thing for sales, what do I get? Sales 
equal total asset turnover times the total assets. Does that make sense? Okay, now we've got that total asset turnover of 0 0.4. And what does that make our total assets? How much? 25 million. 25 million. So does that make our sales equal to 10 million? Yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So then our uh, we go back up here to sales and we've got 10 million. And so I'm looking at uh, 1.1 million. Does that sound right? Yes. Okay. Now I can take that up here. And when I put in 1.1 million, oh by the way, let's just do this, 1.1 million divided by 5.5 million, I think my earnings per share, or 20 cents a share, right? Okay, we're almost there. Now look at this, 0 0.20, I've got 5 divided by 0 0.20, I think, is that 25? Yes. Bam. Is that a long trip? That's a long trip. How many, how many different things do we have to go through here? Well, usually students just want what, me to give them this and give them both price and EPS, right? But we had to go through several steps to get that. By the way, if you see one like this on the exam, what should you do? Skip it. Skip it and come back to it when you've got, oh yeah, we're not going to leave it alone, right? You're going to go through and you're going to da, 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 da. By the way, my exams, let me tell you how my exams are created. I have questions on the exam, about half, that every single one of you should be able to get right. About half. Now, 50%, is that enough to get a, a, the C that you need to graduate? <laughs> no. Okay. So, then I have some questions that everyone plus the D students will get right. Now, is that enough to graduate? <laughs> no. Then I have questions that is that everyone will get, then the D students and the C students will get right. Right? And then I have uh, some, a set of questions that the B students and below will get right, and then I have a few questions that only the A students will get right. Does that start to make sense? And so what we've got here, actually I was running that backwards, but the point is this. The tests are designed to bust you into a nice distribution, and they've done that job very well over the years. By the way, do you think I've been able to tune my stuff in over the years to produce the exact, to, to kind of show that some of you know what you're talking about and others don't? Absolutely. So, what does that mean? If you are a B student in your heart, then you can totally skip 20% of the questions, right, and still be okay. Uh, but then come back to them at the end and try to get half of them right. If you get half of them right, what does that bring you up to? An A, right? By the way, if you want a B, shoot for an A. If you want a C, shoot for a B. And if you want a D, there's something wrong with you, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, that was number eight. I think now we are on to, is it number 11, the next one? Okay. Okay, Bunko Inc. reported a debt to equity ratio of 2.1 times at the end of 2033. If the firm's total asset at year end are 200 million, how much of their finance assets are financed with equity? Okay, this usually throws people into an algebra tailspin, right? But here's what you need to remember. The uh, equity multiplier is equal to total assets over total equity. Hopefully you remember that. But then there's one other thing that's equal to one plus the debt to equity ratio. You guys remember that? I told you you'd be on an exam and you'd say, well, wait a minute, I need the equity multiplier, but all that jerk gave me was the debt to equity ratio at that point. You say, aha, I add one to the debt to equity ratio and that gives me the equity multiplier. What's the debt to equity ratio here? 2.1. So this thing is 3.1. So now we know that total assets over total equity is equal to 3.1.
Now, what are they asking for? They're asking for the total equity. Now, I'm going to do two algebraic steps at one time, and I hope I don't blow your mind. If I do, we can go back and try again. Right? Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to divide both sides by 3.1, and I'm going to multiply both sides by total equity. No, let's just do it by this app. Okay, I'm going to multiply both sides by total equity. Okay, how do I get total equity by itself? Divide, divide, divide. both sides by 3.1. How much is the total assets? 200. 200. What is 200 divided by 3.1? 64.52. Yeah, 64.52 million. Okay, who asked for that one? Are you satisfied? Yeah. You don't seem sure. I'm okay. Okay, I'm going to show you where the magic trick is. It's right here. That's the magic trick. And remembering that that equals this. Okay. Um, cast 12. 12, okay. So she's, uh, she's throwing in a ringer here. 12. There we go. Number 12, last year Marquee Corporation had an ROE of 12.5% and a dividend payout rate of 0.3%. What's the sustainable growth rate? So sustainable growth rate, S, G, R, is equal to, what's the formula? R-O-E. R-O-E times B divided by 1 minus R-O-E times B. Have they given us ROE? Yes. Yeah, 12.5%. By the way, I've got to put that in as a decimal or I will be in a world of hurt. Okay, now, have they given us B? No. No. What did they give us? The payout ratio. They gave us the dividend payout ratio. What's the relationship between B, the retention or plowback ratio, and the dividend payout ratio? Yeah, one minus, right? One minus. And so I've got 0.3 here as my dividend payout ratio. So B is equal to 1 minus 0 0.3. So that is equal to 0 0.7. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm going to plug that in here too by uh, times 0 .0, 0 0.7. Now, I'm going to show you how to do this on your calculator. Easy, easy, easy. Are you ready? You got your calculator ready? Put the Casio away. Oh my goodness. Ms. Armbrister, are you trying to handicap yourself? Don't do that. Okay. Here we go. Um, I'm going to do ROE times B. That's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to say 0 0.125 times 0.7. Did I get that right? Bless you. Okay, now here's what I want to do. I want to say store one. Are you with me so far? No magic. Was it point? Point one two five times point seven. Okay. And I think that's what I got, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Now uh, that's going to be what's on top. But here's what's on bottom. One minus recall one. Boom. That's what's on bottom. Do you guys see that? I mean, this isn't magic. Now, this, the next thing I'm going to show you is close to magic. By the way, this number right now is on top, but I want it on bottom, right? I want it on bottom because I'm dividing by it. So, what button do you think I should hit next? Check above the Y to the X button. What do you see there? It's the 1 over X, right? And so if I do that, bam, I've thrown that into the basement. Do you see that? So now I had this number, and it was uh, down here, or it was this number was actually on the top so far as the calculator is concerned. Now I've thrown it to the bottom. So now all I have to do is multiply by recall 1, which is what's on the top, and that gives me 0.0958, so it's what, 9.59%. How many of you would like to see the calculator steps again? 
Okay, that's enough for me. So here we go. So the first thing I'm going to do, since it shows up twice, that's the reason I'm doing this. This thing shows up twice. I don't want to do that twice. I'm lazy. So I'm going to go with the ROE, 0.125, multiplied by plyback ratio of 0.7. Boom. What do I do with this number? Store where? One. Okay, now uh, for the bottom, uh, here's, let's do it another way. Uh, how about this? Recall one, divide by open parentheses, one minus, recall one, what do I do now? Close parentheses equals. Amazing, I get the same answer, right? Is this way easier for you? Yeah, yeah there we go. Use whichever way works for you. I don't care, right? As long as you get the right answer by some other means than cheating. Okay, on the exam, like these questions, is it going to be like similar to them? Or are we going to be like, whoa? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me tell you, uh, this is a dirty little secret. I used to not have the exam calculation practice. Okay. And, and people were like what you just said, right? Mm -hmm. Even though to me they, they were the same damn thing. So now what I've done is I went through and I pulled all the possible calculation questions from the exam and I changed numbers. And occasionally I changed a name. And occasionally I missed one of the names like you saw in that one, right? <laughs> so it'll look like the same format. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, will the company names be the same? No. no. Will the numbers be the same? No. But if you can do these questions, you should be able to get the, uh, the, the exam. You should be able to do just fine. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of sad that we have to do that, but. No, no, it's perfect. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so that was number 11. Was that number 12? That was number 12. <laughs> okay, now we're on to what, number 14? Is 14 next? Yes. A firm reported a profit margin of 7.5%, total asset turnover of 1.5 times, a debt to equity ratio of point. Folks, please, if you've got a question, please ask me. Mr. Utrecht? Sorry about that. Sorry, Utrecht. Right, Utrecht's a town in Holland. Utrecht is you. Okay. Uh, so, um, a net income of 550000 dividends paid to common shareholders of 100000 The firm has no preferred stock outstanding. What's the firm's internal growth rate? So, we should have started with the question. What's the IGR? IGR is equal to ROA times what? B divided by 1 minus ROA times B. Okay. How do I get ROA? Well, it turns out they gave me profit margin and total asset turnover. And so, uh, ROA is equal to profit margin times total asset turnover. And I can prove it to you, because that's net income over sales times sales over total assets. And what happens to sales? Yeah, it cancels out. And that leaves me with net income over total assets, which by the way, bada bing, bada boom, ROA, right? And so I know I've got it. Do I even need to know the debt to equity ratio? Not so far, right? Okay, uh, net income of 550,000, dividends paid to common shareholders of 100,000. What can I do with that information? I, one of two things. Either I can find the dividend payout ratio, which would be 100 divided by 550, or, and then just take one minus that, or I can say, hey, wait a minute, if they're paying out 100 to dividends, how much are they retaining? Any ideas how much they're retaining? 450. 450. And so it's easy for me to say, well, wait a minute, B is equal to 450 over 550. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I think that simplifies down to 9 over 11. But we'll actually do the calculation here. Um, and we have been given these two numbers. Profit margin is how much? 
Zero point seven five. Yes. What was totalized the current numbers? One point five. Very good. Okay, so that's going to be my ROA. So first thing I'm going to do is figure out what is ROA times B. ROA times B is equal to zero point zero seven five times 1.5, and just to keep from blowing your mind, I'm going to go ahead and say 450 over 550, right? Because that's B. This is B. This is ROA. So here's what I'm going to do. I'll clear my calculator. We figured out B. Right? Yeah. Uh, the dividend pay ratio would be 100 over 550. Yeah. And if we figured that out and then we subtracted it from 1, we would yeah. get exactly the same thing. Okay. I'm glad you brought that up, though, because that's going to be a big question on people's minds. Right? Uh, you always need to read in finance. Figure out whether I've given you stuff to get a retention ratio or the uh, dividend pay ratio. Okay, so here we go. 0.075 times 1.5, that is equal to my ROA. Now I'm going to multiply by 450 equals and then divide by 550. Have I broken any mathematical or algebraic laws? I don't think so. Now what am I going to do with that number? By the way, this is ROA times B. What am I going to do with that number? Store 1. Now, given your preferences, here's what I'm going to do next. Divide by, open parentheses, 1 minus, what? recall 1, recall 1, close parentheses, equals. I'm getting 10.14%. You guys see that? Did we need the debt to equity ratio at all? No. Students sometimes get mad at me because I give them more information than they need to solve a problem. And I say, you think that sucks. Wait until you get into the real world and you don't have enough information to solve. How would you figure out the debt to equity unit? You don't need to. It says, and in fact it tells you right there, debt to equity is equal to 0.9. Oh no. Okay. They gave us that number. Okay. I came out with a different answer. Okay, so, so, that's, ROA, so ROA is 0 0.075, 0 0.075 times 0.15. No, 1.5. 1 1.5, 1 right? Yep. Yep. There times, you go. I'll bet your ROA was off by a factor of 10. Times the 450 divided by 550. Yep. And then the formula being, um, so I came out with one point. 1125 times 0.9, 0.9 being B? That's not 0.9. That's not 0.9. No, 450 divided by 500 would be 0.9, right? Oh, okay. So that's, that's where my calculation is. Yeah. You might need to start using your calculator instead of trusting the old brain. No, no, it's, I promise you it's the TA VA2 plus. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like an answer that would come out of a Casio. Okay. So that's number 14. Uh, number 15 is next. Okay, wheat corporation ended the year with 20, uh, 2023 with an average collection period of 60 days. The firm's credit sales for 2013 were 12 million. What's the approximate year end balance in accounts receivable for wheat corp? So they've given us the collection period. So average collection period is also known as what? Well, no, what's the, another name for that? Days, sales, and receivables, right? So days, we're going to say days and AR, same thing. 
And the formula for that is what? 365 divided by? Yeah, the ad, the count receivable turns. You guys remember that? Whew, okay. Now, um, we need to know what the accounts receivable turns are. Turns. And that is sales divided by accounts receivable. Does that sound right? Okay. And uh, let's see. I think we have everything we need now. We're just going to have to do some algebra. I know you guys hate algebra. Okay, but here we go. So we can take this formula and say that the average collection period is equal to 365. And here's what I want to do. I want to divide by accounts receivable terms. Do you see that? Okay, how do I divide by a fraction? Think back to what, sixth grade, fifth grade? You multiply by the inverse, right? You multiply by the inverse. So uh, divide by a receivable terms is going to be a r divided by sales. Okay, are you still with me? Now we are wanting to find the balance in the accounts receivable. By the way, notice that they said credit sales. It's always credit sales in this formula because any sales we don't make up make on credit don't wind up in our accounts receivable. Does that make sense? Okay, and we're looking for accounts receivable. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to um, I'm going to do some algebra here. I'll do it one step at a time, just so you guys don't get lost, right? Are you ready? Okay, accounts receivable, and I'm, I'm flopping sides, so don't let that freak you out. Accounts receivable uh, times 365 is equal to average collection period times sales. You see what I did there? I multiplied both sides by sales. Sales canceled out over here, and so it ends up next uh, multiplied by accounts, sorry, average collection period. Okay, now, one more step to get accounts receivable by itself, what would that be? Accounts receivable is equal to average collection period times sales. Yeah, divide by 365. By the way, given that you know that this problem is going to be on the exam, would it make sense to write this formula on your sheet. Whew. Okay. By the way, that was a hint, right? Okay, so here we go. What have we got here? We've got uh, 60 days sales and receivables, 60, and how much of the sales? 12. 12 million. 12 million. Divide by 365. So I'm going to guess it's around 2 million. It comes out to be 1,972,600 questions. Okay, unless I, listen closely folks, because this is a question you're all going to have. Unless I tell you otherwise, all sales are on credit. But if you're given total sales and credit sales, you should use credit sales because credit sales are the only ones that wind up in accounts receivable. But not all of them. Not all the sales. So assuming you made some of your sales in cash, we're not going to worry about them because they don't show up in your accounts receivable. It's only when I sell on credit. In other words, I send them the product and they haven't sent me the money yet. Now I have an accounts receivable. Does that make sense? Your neighbor knows. He's nodding his head. <laughs> Can you explain it to her after class? Oh, very good. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Now I think we're on to number 17. Oh my goodness, this one is so easy. And you guys are going to kick shells because you're going to see how easy this is.
Now, as in most things in finance, the problem is reading. What is the value in year three of a thousand dollar cash flow made in year six? When is a thousand dollar cash flow made? In year six. And when do we want to know the value of that thing? Year three. So if you're having troubles mentally, uh, draw a picture. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I've got this thousand dollar cash flow here in year six. And I want to know what is the value of that thing in year three. Now, this looks to me a whole lot like a future value. Is that right? And this looks a whole lot like a present value. By the way, present value just comes before future value. Okay, now, how many years? Three. Three. N is equal to six minus three equals three years. And then they give us one more piece of information. What do they tell us? At 10% interest rate, and so I for Y is going to be 10. So get your calculator up. Claire, what's the first thing I do before we're doing TVM? Second, future value. And now I'm going to put in what, 1,000 for the future value? What do I put in for N? 3. N. What do I put in for I for Y? 10. I for Y. And then what do I compute? Present value, I'm getting $751.31. Now, notice there's a minus sign. Why? Yeah, their cash flows in opposite directions. The sign convention for the TIBA2 plus. Oh, wow, we're, we're making progress here. She's got the Casio underneath the TIBA2 plus. Okay, so the sign convention is cash flows in opposite directions have opposite signs. Does it matter what I put in for uh, which for which? So here, for instance, I could say 1,000. Boom. Negative. Negative, negative. There we go. Future value. And then compute present value. You see that? As long as one is positive, the other one's negative, you're good to go. Questions? Okay. That was 17, now we're on to 18. You will receive a $750 cash flow in two years, $1,000 cash flow in three years, and pay, 500, pay 300 in five years. If interest rates are 6% a year, what's the combined present value of these cash flows? I was hoping someone was gonna ask this question. Okay. So let's map out our cash flows here. How many years are we going out? Five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, now it says I will receive 750 in two years. What does that mean? At the end of year two, I'm going to receive $750. The receive means it's positive to me, I'm getting that money. And so I'm gonna draw the arrow up here. And that's going to be 750. And then they tell me I'm year going to again. Year three, what's going to happen? 1, yeah, 1,000. So I'm going to draw a year three here, draw a bigger arrow, and that's going to be 1,000. Now, what happens in year four? Ooh, Zero. Nothing happens in year four, right? And what happens in year five? Yeah, but, and read, read the question very carefully. It's pay, right? And so we've got a cash flow. Uh, I'm going to put the five up there. We've got a cash flow out here. I'm going to say minus 300, right? That's $300 going out from us. Okay, now, the combined present value, there's two ways you could do that. We could go through and find the present value for each individual thing, and then we could just add them all together, and you would get exactly the right answer. However, that's very time consuming. So here's what we're going to do and say. Clear CF second clear work. Do you see what I did there? Clear CF second and then the clear button one more time. Okay, what cash flow happens at time zero? 
times zero. Zero. Zero down. What cash flow happens at time one? Zero. Zero. Very good. Now, I've got to hit enter so the calculator knows that I, I'm serious about that. I'm going to arrow down. How many times in a row does that cash flow occur? One. One. And so we're just going to arrow down. What's C? Zero. Two. 750. Enter. Arrow down. How many times in a row does that cash flow happen? Just the once, arrow down. What is C03? 1,000. Enter, arrow down. And it only happens once. What's C04? Zero. Zero. And we've got to go ahead and hit enter so the calculator knows we're serious. Arrow down, that one only happens one time. What do I put in for C05? Negative 300. So I'm going to hit 300, negative, enter. Now, just make sure you've got all of these in here because sometimes people forget to hit enter. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go up arrow and make sure that all those cash flows actually made it in. Right? Okay, so now, what button do I hit next? NPV, because remember the definition of NPV is the sum of the present values of all the cash flows, uh, positive is in, negative is out, uh, discounted is appropriate rate and all that. So here we go. What is the rate? Six. Six percent. So six, enter, arrow down, and then I hit to compute. The sum of the present values of all those cash flows is $1,282.94. The CF keys will save you a boatload of time if you just learn how to use them. Can you, can you run through that calculation real quick on the time you on the calculator? Uh, so, you, so here we go. So what I did is I went through and I entered the cash flows. There's nothing at time zero. Right. There's nothing at time one. So you don't have to enter on the zero one. You do have to enter on the zero ones, except for CF zero. Why? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not from Texas. I don't know. Okay. Are you okay there? Mr. Nylon? Uh, you want to see more? Okay, so we entered all those cash flows. They all only happened once, right? And the cash flow time four was zero, but I had to hit enter because otherwise it won't believe me. And, that, and then I'm going to put in negative 300 at time 5. Why is it negative, Mr. Nylon? Because you paid out. Yeah, exactly. Okay, now what button did I hit next? NPV. NPV. And what did I put in for the interest rate? That required return of 6% per year. 6, enter, arrow down. And then I hit compute. You can go back and watch the video later. Yeah. Okay. Video. Very good. <laughs> okay. So there's 18. Now we're on to 19. A small business owner visits his bank to ask for a loan. I am so glad someone asked for this one too. And by the way, notice it goes back and forth between she and he in this question, I think. Uh, this is another one of those where I kind of changed it up. Small business owner visits to ask for a loan. The owner states that he can repay a loan of $2,500 per month for the next three years and then $1,500 per month for the two years after that. If the bank is charging customers 9% APR, how much would it be willing to lend the business owner? When you borrow money, you are borrowing the future value or the present value? That's the present value. So what I'm really asking here is what are the present value of these cash flows at the interest rate that they're giving us? And the way we want to do this is to use our CF keys. In fact, this is the only way I've ever seen students get this right. There is another way to do this where you kind of do two annuities and then move one back to time. No, don't do that. You will mess yourself up. Here's the way. Let me show you the way. CF, second. Clear work. What am I going to put in for CF zero? Zero, nothing. For some reason, I can hit down and everything works there. Now, C zero one. What am I going to put in for C zero one? Two thousand five hundred. Twenty five hundred. Enter. 
arrow down. What's F01? Three. Three, no. 36, why? Because, yeah, you're looking at monthly payments, right? And so it's actually 36, enter, arrow down. Oh, what's the next cash flow? 1,500. Enter, arrow down. What's that zero two? Very good, 24. Enter. Okay, now, if I want to find the present value of all those cash flows, what button? Net present. Net present value, right? Okay, now, the interest. Keep in mind, those payments we've been looking at are per month. And this interest rate we've been given is an APR, yeah. Yeah. which is the monthly interest rate times 12, right? And so in order to find out what the monthly interest rate is, I'm going to have to divide by 12. And so I'm going to say 9 divided by 12, got to hit equal, <clears throat> enter. That's my monthly interest rate. Remember, the interest rate always has to match up with the frequency that you're looking at. If you've got monthly payments, you need a monthly interest rate. If you've got annual payments, you need an annual interest rate. Okay, now, what should I do next? Mr. Nylon? Um, what button do you think I should hit? Oh, one, one step in between. Arrow down. Oh, by the way, she says enter. I've already done it, but I'll hit it. And here's how you know that I've already hit enter, that little triangle. Okay. Arrow down. What do I hit now? Mr. Nylon. Compute. Compute. Very good. And they're willing to own, loan this person $103,706.87. Why? Because that's the present value of the payments that the person's able to make. And when we borrow money, we borrow the present value. Questions? Which other way can we use so that aside from using the calculator? Say again? Which other way? Which other way? Can we use the solving aside from using the calculator? You could um, figure out the present value of the first annuity and then add <coughs> the present value of the second annuity. But yes. uh, what you have to do is remember that the second annuity the cash flow at time one for it is actually the, or is a, or time zero for it is actually the cash flow of the last annuity. So that means when you figure out the present value of that now future value, you have to remember that it's like off by one and bring it back to present value and then you add those two together. A, it's an enormous pain in the ass. B, you will get it wrong. In the heat of battle. <laughs> You will get it wrong. I did it. You did it wrong? You did it? You no, got, did you get it I right? I did right, but you, I make this calculation and it was like took a lot of time. Yeah. yeah. So it takes a lot of time. By the way, in the exam, how much time are you going to have per question? Uh, two minutes. Less than two minutes, right? Because you get a 75 minutes divided by 40 questions. That's less than two, right? Did it take you uh, less than two minutes? No. No. <laughs> I know you like formulas. I like formulas too. I know you like to understand where the numbers come from. I do too. Is the exam the time to be doing that? No. no. Okay, questions? So on the last one that you entered there, which was the F02, uh, it's uh, 24. Right. Then at that point, is that where? It should just show interest at that point. Well, no, you got to hit the NPV button. Okay, any other questions on this one? Now we are on to number 20. Oh, I'm so glad someone asked this one. Because this one blows people's minds. Payday loans are very short-term loans that could charge very high interest rates. If we borrow 500 today and repay 600 in two weeks, uh, what's the compound or effective annual rate implied by this 20% rate charge for only two weeks? First of all, I want you to see that they did some of the work for you. They told you that's a 20% return. Did I even have to tell you that? No, you could have said 600, 
minus 500, divide by 500, and figure it out on your own that that was a 20% return. But I'm trying to help you out here, right? Okay, so we know that it's 20% for every two weeks. And remember that the APR is the subperiod interest rate times the number of periods per year. How many two week periods are there in a year? 26. 26. There are 26. And so to find the APR, I'm going to take 20. And we're going to say that that's also the nominal is 20% and we're going to do it in percentages because that's the way the calculator talks and we're going to multiply that by 26. Now what function on my calculator am I going to use? Uh, second number. Second? No. Uh, two. Number two, very good. Now here's the nominal. By the way, do I have to erase the old stuff? No, I can type right over it. So the nominal here is going to be 20 times 26 equal, you got to hit equal, and then enter. If you don't hit enter, it's like it never even happened. How do I know I hit enter? I see the little triangle. There we go. How many compoundings per year? 26. Enter. There we go. And then what do I do? Compute. Holy moly, 11,347.55%. Do you see the power of compounding there? The power of compounding. Okay, now let's walk through this one more time. How do I find the nominal? I take the subperiod rate times the number of subperiods per year. How did I know that the number of subperiods per year was 26? Because it's a two week period and there are 52 weeks in the year. And so I'm going to take that 20% times 26 for an APR of 520%, which already sounds ridiculous, right? And then I'm going to, I got to hit enter, arrow up. What do I put in for compoundings per year? How many times per year does this thing compound? 26, right? And I got to hit enter. And then I arrow up. And now the calculator is going to say E, F, F. What do I do? Compute, and that's when we get this enormous, disgusting number. Okay. Yeah, right before I decided to go to doctoral school, I thought about opening up one of those payday loan pro things because you know you can make a lot of money. And my mom told me it was absolutely amoral, and she would not respect me if I did. So I became a professor. Go ahead. Can you do the calculation? If they calculate the you want to see it one more time? I'd be glad to. Okay, so just to make sure this is a kind of cleared out, I'm going to say second clear work. And now for nominal, uh, what I did is I took the subperiod rate, 20, multiplied by 26. That's the number of periods in a year. And then I hit equal. And then I hit enter. Got to hit enter or it's like it never even happened. Now, what is the next step? What button should I hit next? I'm going to hit the arrow up. And keep in mind, it keeps the old number here. So we already know what goes in here. But I'm going to type 26 enter. That's the number of compoundings per year. And then I'm going to hit the arrow up. And there's one more thing. What do you think I need to hit here? Yeah. And there you go. Other questions? Okay, now number 23. Oh, this is a good one too. Okay, a car company is offering a choice of deals. You can receive 1,000 cash back on the purchase or a 3% APR. By the way, do you see that or? Can you have both of these things? No. no. A 3% APR five year loan. The price of the car is 38900 and you could obtain a five year loan from your credit union at 7% APR. What is the monthly payment of each deal? So here's what I want you to do I want you to make a table, and on one side, I want it to be cash back, and on the other, it's going to be the 3% APR. 
And for both of these, we're going to figure out the present value, the amount that you borrow, the number of periods, and the interest rate. And then we're going to compute, by the way, what does it ask us to compare? The payments. We're going to compute the payments. So here we go. Uh, on the cash back, I'm spending 38900 but they give me 1000 cash back. What is the present value for that loan? 37900 Yeah, $37,900. So I'm going to say, I'm going to go ahead and put the negative up here just so you can see it. Minus $37,900. Now what's the present value for this loan? $38,900, right? Because you don't get the 1000 cash back. Because remember, this is an or. Okay, now, uh, they say five-year loan or five years. What's in? 60. Why 60 and not five? Because we're looking at months, right? I for Y. Uh, let's start over here on the 3% APR. What is 3% APR? 3 divided by 12, which is the same as 1 divided by 4, which is 0 0.25. 0.25, that's your monthly interest rate. What is this one? It's going to be 7, seven divided by 12. And we're going to have to hit the equal there before we, we enter that number. Okay, so here we go. Let's figure this out. What's the first thing I do when I'm going to use my time value of money keys? Second, future value. Now, I'm going to put in 37,900. Negative present value, 60, and 7 divided by 12 equals I per Y. And then I'm going to compute the payment. I'm getting $750.47. Now, let's do the other one. Uh, the present value for it, 38,900, negative, present value. I'm going to put in the I per Y as 0.25, I per Y. Do I need to re-enter in? Now, same, right? And the calculator remembers. So all I have to do is say compute PMT. I'm getting $698.98. You, as a consumer, which of these do you prefer? Right? Wouldn't you love to have a lower car payment? And so that's how you can choose between these two offers. By the way, it works that way because the periods are exactly the same. If the periods were different, then things might get a little hairier, uh, but I won't do that to you. What if you pass out 1000 and you get, like, say, 4% off? If you could invest the thousand, so if you borrowed the money, you didn't accept the cash back. So no, no, right over here, you would accept the cash back. You take that thousand cash back and invest that separately outside uh -huh. of the direct context of this question. Right. If you can make four percent on that, doesn't that in turn make that better deal? Okay. And this is an argument that you'll hear people at car uh, joints say all the time. They're like, hey man, I can show you how to make more money if, and then they'll tell you about investing that money in CDs or some crap like that. First of all, there are, it's possible, but there are fees associated with the loans, origination fees, that you're probably not being told about at that time. By the way, every time someone at a car lot talks you into financing, what do you think happens for them? Yeah, they get paid a commission. Otherwise, why would they be trying to sell you on it, right? Hey, let me tell you about our great financing deal. I'm not kidding. One time I bought a car, and I, I, got, I went for this extra optional package or whatever, and I actually heard the salesman. Someone says, hey, yeah, I heard you sold the whatever. And he's like, yeah. And they're like, yeah. And they were actually, actually high-fiving. Now, I thought this was kind of rude because there I was, right? Why were they high-fiving? Because the commission on that was 50%. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, uh, anything that's going to give you a higher percent return than probably the car loan rate, this 7% uh, APR, 
is not going to be risk-free. So I can show you how to invest that money in the S&P 500 and make 23% or 20, except for one thing. Is it guaranteed? No. Is the car loan guaranteed that you're going to have to pay that? If you want to keep driving the car, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, watch out for these shady car loan people at the lots. Bunch of snakes. So how can you put the interest rate in? Yeah. And you got the 0.25. Okay. The next button you should hit is compute, right? Um, yeah, I hit compute payment. Okay. Yeah, go back and watch the video. By the way, I also have this example posted out where I think I've actually showed you how to do it on the calculator. We can see it on the screen. Questions? Okay, what time Sunday night do you need to be in the exam? 7.59 p.m. and you need to be answering questions. When should you take the exam? Earlier. To give me the opportunity to reset your attempt if something goes terribly wrong. Chapter 10 for Tuesday.